a people ever, ever grateful for all his great goodness. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. You probably remember from your uh, high school chemistry class the concept of a limiting reagent. Got you all now, right? <clears throat> In a chemical reaction, uh, if you're trying to synthesize a particular uh, chemical, then there are ingredients that go on into that chemical called reactants. And you can make as much of the product as you have ingredients to make it. You with me there? I recall that when the concept was introduced, uh, a simple analogy was used to uh, make it a little bit easier uh, to, for us to understand this concept of a limiting reagent. You're going to build an automobile. You're an automobile manufacturer. <clears throat> Interesting that in, in these times, uh, uh, supply chain enters into common conversation, doesn't it? You're an automobile manufacturer, and you've got a where we got warehouses that are full of tires and motors and doors and. But on your shelf, you've got three steering wheels, and that's it. How many cars can you build for delivery? That's it, right? Yeah. Well, really, you're going to keep one for yourself and only deliver two, right? You, you, you're limited, aren't you? You're limited because of, a, of a, a lack. And yes, supply chain enters into common conversation in our days. You know, we've got inflation and we've got COVID and we've got supply chain problems. It, it, I mean, this is the stuff that, that, that's talked about in, um, in everyday news, isn't it? Why? Because manufacturers of goods are having problems getting the stuff that they need to build. And they might have an abundance of one, uh, one material that's necessary for their product and a, and a great abundance and a ready supply of another one. But I know we were sitting in one of our deacons meetings some, some weeks ago and, and Steve was telling me how automobile manufacturers have, have just big, huge, vast lots of cars that are all complete except for a few little computer chips that they don't have to go on into these things so that they can deliver them, Right? I mean, Tesla made the, you know, was making news there, you know, a few weeks, they're always making news, but they were making news a few weeks ago because they had very cleverly reprogrammed some of the chips that they could, that would allow them to deliver their automobiles when others weren't delivering automobiles. And what has this got to do with Sunday morning service in church? Well, the, the concept of, <clears throat> of a limiting reagent uh, comes to bear on our, our subject here, if there's a factor that's limiting. Uh, we were talking along these lines a little bit in our men's breakfast yesterday. <clears throat> and we were talking of how in order for a Christian to grow and be healthy, they need a well-balanced presentation of gospel truth. You with me there? And we endeavor to, as a fellowship, to bring to the people of God a well-balanced presentation of the truth which will enable them to flourish in their walk with the Lord. Along the same lines, maybe we'll draw on yet one more little example, little analogy. We, um, we enjoyed the Thanksgiving dinner. We, we eat every day. Uh, <clears throat> why does the parent make their child, and I'm really showing my age, you know, this is real old school stuff, but why does a parent make their kid eat everything on the plate? That is, not only their, their meat and their mashed potatoes, but they also got to eat the broccoli. Why is that? Well, an informed parent uh, makes their kid clean the plate because, well, when I was a kid, it's because there were people starving in Africa and China. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> So you got to eat everything. 
But certainly, we understand a little bit about nutrition. And we understand that it's not sufficient just to get your, your, uh, your protein or your carbs, but you need some vitamins as well, don't you? So that's why you eat your green stuff. Because you know what? Your body can't use the protein and can't use the carbs without the vitamins that are in the vegetables. And, and those truths are not, that's, that's true about your body. And you know what? I like to insert this on a regular basis. It's not coincidence that it's that way. It's not. You know why it's that way? Because God made it that way. And I don't mean that he's the one that made your body. No, he made it that way to teach us spiritual truth. It's all about spiritual truth. I'm not, this is not me really trying to stretch some example from nature to make a spiritual application. No, God designed things natural to speak of things spiritual. And if you haven't come to that conclusion yet, then okay, I'm glad you're here this morning because we got some things we can teach you. Along those lines, maybe I'll go ahead and take the opportunity right now. <clears throat> Along those lines, we gather on a regular basis. We place plenty of emphasis on gathering on a regular basis. Um, maybe Sunday morning, you get your, um, your protein. And um, Sunday afternoon, you get your carbs. And on a Wednesday night, you get your vitamins. Need I say more? Hmm? I'm sure I'll say more. <laughs> It's just my nature. <laughs> but rather presumptuous of us to think that, you know, okay, just like a, a, a young child, well, I'll eat this stuff because that tastes good to me. Picking and choosing. And a parent doesn't allow their kids to do that, do they? No, they don't. No. Parents require their children to eat what's been put before them because they know what, the parents know what the kids have need of more than the kids do, don't they? See, there I go, starting... Down the track. Turn with me in your Bibles over to 3 John chapter 2. 3 John chapter 2. We'll read this verse and then give you the title. This is for Mike Bergen's benefit. Third John chapter 2. Third John, verse 2, excuse me. Third John, I'm reading my notes here. It goes 3 John 2, and there's nothing after the 2. Verse 2 of Third John, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. That's God's will for us, to be healthy spiritually, in every respect healthy. He doesn't want us lopsided. You ever see some of uh, you ever see these guys that lift lift weights and all they work is their biceps? I mean, like the bicep is the only muscle, right? They got these little bird legs, but this big beefy upper body. You know, I mean, we've all seen people like that, right? No, maybe not. <laughs> but there are people that do that, placing an imbalanced in, in emphasis on one aspect or another. We don't want to live that kind of Christian life. Above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in good health, even as thy soul prosperous. Well, we've entitled this teaching Flourish. Flourish. It is our interest here as a body, as your pastor, to teach and to, to cultivate and, and to maintain an environment not only through teaching and preaching, but in every respect, an environment where the people of God could flourish in their walk with the Lord. I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in good health, even as thy soul prospereth. And, and along these same lines, John 10.10, 10, Jesus says that the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. It is God's purpose for us to walk in abundant life or, or, or fullness of life in every area of our lives. Jesus speaks of some opposition here, doesn't he? There is a real devil. There is sin in our members. We've got flesh that we have to contend with. And those influences are always in opposition to the work of God's spirit, uh, which is directed toward helping us grow and flourish across the board in every area of our lives. 
God does not want us to be imbalanced in, in our growth and development. God doesn't want you to, God has more for you than just a, uh, a healthy marriage. He wants you to be an effective witness. Amen? Not only does God want you to have a healthy marriage and be an effective witness, he also wants you healthy in your body, doesn't he? Not only does he want you uh, healthy in your marriage and, uh, and uh, an effective witness and healthy in your body, but he also wants you to be one who loves and lays down your life for your brothers and sisters in the Lord. And on and on we could go. There are so many areas of Christianity, of, of spiritual growth that the scriptures speak to. And we don't want to neglect any of them. We don't want to overemphasize any and we don't want to take for granted or, or neglect anything that God has put, to, put before us in his word for our spiritual well-being, for his glory. And really that's, you know, I say for his glory, that's where we want to, uh, to, to, to jump on in at this point and consider that most fundamental, most foundational to a healthy Christian walk <clears throat> is a, an understanding of the, of the fact that God is to be exalted in all things. That's point number one today. There's one true God who is to be exalted and his people are to be taught to highly exalt him. One true God who is to be exalted and his people are to be taught to highly exalt him. You believe in God today it, re regarding the, the need to be taught to exalt the Lord. You, you believe in God. You believe in Jesus Christ who died on the cross. But do we exalt him? Do we, do, we, do we hold him in the kind of esteem and reverence that we could? I think that we'd all probably honestly say about ourselves that we will, if we continue on in our, in our pursuit of God, we will love God more next year than we do today. We will, have, we will hold him in greater esteem, greater honor, greater reverence in the future because we'll get to know him more. We'll be taught more of his greatness and our smallness. Amen? He'll reveal himself to us. An environment for growth, healthy growth, must be characterized by an understanding of there being one true God who is exalted <clears throat> and the people of God in that environment are taught to highly esteem God. This may seem, again, we're here before, we, we've got our Bibles on our laps and we've got, you know, the, the cross hanging up and we're, we, we call ourselves Christians. I think most, if not all, would call themselves Christians. <clears throat> so uh, an exaltation of God may seem self-evident, but I trust we know I trust we've come to observe, and if not, if you haven't had occasion to, I want to tell you there's a whole lot in professed Christianity that is not God-exalting, but is man-exalting. It is man-centered, man-oriented. <clears throat> Large and, and very popular uh, movements, ministries, so-called, uh, emphasize to the neglect of other things. They, they emphasize, yes, things like, well, uh, years ago, there was one called Focus on the Family. Well, there may be some uh, need for teaching on how to have good families, but a Christian doesn't focus on the family. A Christian focuses on Jesus. Amen? And Jesus teaches us how to have good families, among the other things that we talked of. <clears throat> there are ministries that um, certainly are very directed toward helping you become a better you. Right? Yeah. Reaching your full potential. There are ministries that, 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 that are so focused on getting your body healed or financial prosperity or, or focused aspects of ministry that are so focused on, on you recovering some, from some uh, self-destructive behavior or recovering from psychological damage that you, that you experienced in childhood. And that's the focus of the ministry. And God is to be the focus of the ministry under all circumstances, at all times. Amen? All times. 
and under all circumstances. And, and I, I mean, I could go on. I mean, there's, there are ministries, so-called, that are built upon their praise and worship. We, we've got to have exhilarating, uplifting, yes, the, the positive and uplifting. You see the billboards for the radio channels, the religious radio channels. It's positive and it's uplifting. It makes you feel good about you. And the emphasis is on Jesus Christ is, is, is put secondary, and it should not be so. If you're going to be a healthy Christian, healthy Christian, then your eyes better be on the Lord. He's got to be all in all. And, and you might not feel positive and uplifted. And you not, might not be healthy in your body. And you may still, still feel the, the, the pain of, of childhood abuse and neglect. And you should still give God the glory. You should be able to lift up your voice and give him praise and thanks. There are a whole lot of things from which we will never recover in this life. And a whole lot of areas in which we will never see victory over a sin. And we'll not be prosperous. And we may, we may go to the grave with some serious uh, sickness and, and malady in our bodies. And God is to be praised. He is to be highly exalted. It's got to be Jesus first. And that is a key ingredient to a, an environment where the people of God will flourish. I know that, that any of us may come to the Lord with a particular... Maybe you came to Jesus when your marriage was falling apart. And there are plenty of people who would share such a testimony. There are, there are people here today that came to Jesus uh, when they were just, I mean, just on, on the street in the gutters. Uh, on, on drugs, alcohol. And in my distress, I cried out to Jesus and the Lord heard my voice. He meets us wherever we are when we're, when we're calling on his name, doesn't he? But he knows what we have need of moving forward. And he teaches us to turn our eyes off of self. What about the person who comes to Jesus? You know, they're, yeah, they're that derelict in the gutter and they come to Jesus and God sets them free from, you know, from heroin or from, from uh, alcohol. And, uh, and they get their feet on the ground and they get back in their job and they get their family back together and they forget about God. And how many people have that kind of testimony? It happened. They were just, they were just so desperate. Call not, if God, if you're out there, save me. And God in his mercy, here's their cry, doesn't he? plucks them up out of that miry clay, sets them upon a rock, establishes their going. And, and God gives warnings like that, doesn't he? Beware, beware, lest that happen to you. God is always to be exalted, always. Your problem is, is not so big that, you should, that you're, you're, you're given a pass to get your eyes off of Jesus and give him the glory to his name. And you will never have things going so well for you that you don't need to any longer to be real serious about reverencing a holy, holy, holy God. Amen? Amen. In Matthew 22, verses 36 through 38, the love of God is, is taught and commanded in the Scripture. And so we, we teach and, and command these things. When I say command, I think you understand that uh, we tell the people of God what God says. Matthew 22, verses 36 through 38. Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. There are a lot of commandments. There are a lot of laws and ordinances. There are a lot of... I mean, here, Jesus is talking to a Jew who is familiar with the Levitical, Levitical law, all the ordinances with regard to washings and cleansings and purification, all the ways in which you have to offer sacrifices, all the things that you can and can't do. There are a lot of laws that, that the Jews would be familiar with. And, and this guy says, what's the greatest? And Jesus, without any hesitation, says, it's, you're to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. Put Jesus first. Put God first. Always and at all times. We don't make decisions in our lives for self-serving purposes. We make decisions for our lives that honor God, that acknowledge his greatness, his mastery over our lives. We're to love the Lord with our all. 
In Matthew 6, 33, the scripture says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Matthew 6, 10, our prayer is to be what? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That's how he taught his disciples to pray. That's putting God first. Always God first. And again, if you sit here and think, well, you know, uh, <clears throat> I think you're preaching to the choir this morning, Pastor. We know these things. Yeah, well, happy are we are if we do them. Do we put Jesus first? Is he, is he, the, is he the one who is revered above all? And, and his word... Uh, authoritative in our lives. Jesus really master. That's what Lord means. Master, the one calling the shots. And when these truths are well established in our hearts and lives, we can face the trials of life and find in Jesus the rock solid support and the strength that we have need of. Amen? And if we're, if we're faltering and we're overly consumed with our problems, our, whether, whether it be our problems or our prosperity, God has his way of bringing us back to this. Your eyes need to be on me. Are there people that, 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 um, that need God's help that they might prosper financially? Yep, there are. There are. But God wants to prove to, prove to them that he's their source. Doesn't he? Yeah. And are there people that are, that are, <clears throat> uh, that are perplexed and in distress and uh, maybe have pain and their body's wrecked with pain and they need God is the healer, yeah? But if healing becomes the all-consuming concern, then I got a problem that's bigger than my pain. Are you with me there? Yeah. And we speak of these things and continue to use these examples because uh, what we're talking about is the, the, the goal or the objective, the plan to provide an environment where all ingredients are present, not none neglected, none overemphasized, because it is the desire of the Lord that his people would flourish and prosper, spirit, soul, and body. And God, is, God himself has got to be foundational in such an environment. Amen? In a God-exalting environment, the people of God will be taught <clears throat> that above all else, God is to be exalted. That's what we're doing now. You don't just read your Bible, and, okay, you know, God is the theme of the book. We forget sometimes. And we get our eyes off. We, we're distracted by the things of this world, aren't we? We're distracted by our own interests. And so in a, in a God-exalting environment, the people of God recognize the need to be taught. You all have Bibles. You all have the Holy Spirit to teach you. You can read can you hear from God? If you're a born-again Christian, you can hear from God. His sheep know his voice, don't they? One of the things that God teaches us in our Bibles is that we need to be taught by those that are placed over us in the Lord. We need to be exhorting one another, don't we? If a brother or sister comes to me with, with, with ministry from the Word, I need to be open to that kind of ministry, don't I? Because I need that. God has provided for me through ministry that I receive from my overseers, from my brothers and sisters in the Lord. I read that in my Bible. People need to be taught that God is to be exalted. That's not just a given. <clears throat> Christians must understand our place before our Creator, our Redeemer, our God and Father. Look with me to Psalm 95. In a God, we're talking about a God-exalting environment, an, an environment in which God is, is highly esteemed, highly valued. How do you see yourself as you stand before God? In Psalm 95, verses 6 and 7, the scripture says, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. How do we, we relate to the Almighty? Here in recent services, we've talked about uh, keeping our relationship personal. That's God's desire, isn't it? that we would relate to him in a personal way. He wants us to know him as our father. He wants us to be able to think of ourselves as his, as his children, or here he says, the sheep of his pasture. A nice little uh, <clears throat> picture, isn't it? Nice, cute, fuzzy little sheep snuggling up to the shepherd. We like the picture, warm and fuzzy. God is our maker, isn't he? He's our maker. In, <clears throat> in Psalm 100, 
Know ye, verse three, know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We're created. We're created. We think pretty highly of ourselves in this world. I mean, I mean and, and in this culture. You know, we're, we're 21st century, but we're not only 21st century, we're 21st century America. And we live in one of the most prosperous areas in a very, very prosperous nation. And we have a tendency to think pretty highly of ourselves. We don't go around boasting it necessarily, but we can, uh, we're, we're doing okay for ourselves. God made us. Spoke us into existence. We were not and he created us. This is a proper attitude of mind, a proper understanding to maintain that we would be small in our own eyes. Like the Lord said to, to, through Samuel to Saul, when you were small in your own eyes, then I could use you. We need to not think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think, but to think soberly. God's the maker. He's the Almighty, and He is our Creator. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, <clears throat> By Him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions, principalities or powers, all things were created by Him and for Him. We're created by Him, and we are created for Him. Is that the way you face each day? I, I'm here to do what God, my maker, has, has ordained me to do. From eternity past, he knows I'm not just stumbling through life. There are no coincidences. God didn't just uh, speak into existence, the, the universe, the world's humanity, and then walk out and just expect us to do the best we could. You know better than that. You really believe that God does have a plan for your life, that all things are known to him. He knows all your tomorrows. He knows what he wants to work into you, what, what he wants to work out of you, what he wants to set you free from. You believe that. Do we live that way? Do we really live with an, uh, uh, a regular awareness that ours are steps that are to be ordered by God? Do we walk in an awareness that we are not our own? We were made by him and we were made for him for his pleasure, for his glory. But what about me and my life? I mean, God wants me to have, you know, enjoy my life, doesn't he? You know, you can't enjoy life if Jesus isn't central to that life. Can't. And if it's not clear, or from time to time you lapse into some state where you've lost focus, then guess what? God, who is rich in mercy, will bring you back to that awareness. It's not about the stuff that you possess or the plans for your future or getting this or getting rid of that. Or No, nope. It's all about life is in the sun. Life is in the sun. That's what it's all about, isn't it? And I think that, you know, sometimes we have the expression, you know, I don't know about you, but I do know about you. You are like me. We all lose focus on that all too often. Needs to be kept in clear focus. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verses 19 and 20. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Right the way he puts it. Don't you know that? Don't you know that you're not your own? You're bought with a price. If you're a Christian, if you're going to claim Christianity, then you need to remember, understand and remember that you belong to God. You're his purchased possession. You do his bidding. You seek his will and as you know it, you walk it out. And yep, this is what? This is foundation. This is fundamental Christianity. And 
these truths are foundational to a healthy walk with the Lord. If, if these truths aren't foundational, then the storms will come and the winds will blow and beat violently and you'll fall. Oh, maybe not necessarily to destruction, but you're going to take some shots that you didn't need to take if you had learned these lessons. Jesus has got to be first. The Lord God all in all. You're not your own. God is to be feared. God is to be feared. Look with me over to Psalm 89. He's our creator. He's the one that made us. And when we consider that we're not our own, he made us, made for his glory, we should... Never take lightly the smallest, slightest disregard for his authority in our lives. God is to be feared. Psalm 89, verses 6 and 7. For who in the heaven can be compared unto the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto the Lord? God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be had in reverence of all them that are about him. He's greatly to be feared. I think that there's a a lot that we need to learn about the fear of the Lord. We, we take his authoritative role in our lives far too casually. I've got a, a, a beautiful little grandson who likes to wrestle and, and play rough. If um, any of you have um, uh, had the experience of having a, a little toddler you know, run by and swatch you, that's just his way of expressing affection. He's come ripping by and bam you up the backside. <laughs> Turn tail and run and expect you to chase him. We're well, going to have some fun. <clears throat> but I'll grab him and pick him up and wrestle with him a little bit, you know, just hold him and, you know, and he's going to try to resist me. And I'll just tell him as I'm, you know, holding him motionless uh, against his will. I'm stronger than you, Elias. I'm stronger than you are. <laughs> Our God is almighty. He is almighty. He is the one that has spoken into existence the universe. He knows all. I mean, how about the knowledge of God? He, he knows every thought that you have ever thought or will ever think. Not just you, but all human beings. He knows all the intricacies of things material, natural, physical, spiritual he knows all that's a mighty god he ought to be feared he ought to be revered always at all times held in the highest esteem and regard again that is that is there's a lot of room for us to learn and to grow in the area of the fear of the lord in jeremiah chapter 10 verse 7 says, who would not fear you, O king of the nations? For this is your rightful due. For among all the wise men of the nations and in all their kingdoms, there is none like you. There is none beside our God. None so glorious. And in Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10, the scripture says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You might be a... Uh, an active, avid student of the Word of God. You might know uh, where this verse is found and the reference for that passage, and you might be able to quote several uh, verses that would pertain to any particular topic. But the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You might have knowledge, but if you don't fear God, then, then uh, you haven't got off first base yet. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Again, these truths foundational to a healthy walk with the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of, the, of wisdom. The knowledge of the holy is understanding. God is to be obeyed. God is to be obeyed. Jesus is Lord. I said it a moment ago. Lord means master. He calls the shots. 
Again, if we consider that our lives are not our own, we've been purchased with his blood, then we consider that at best we're servants of the Most High. We do what we're told to do. Moses, that mighty man of God called a servant of the Lord, wasn't he? Paul, how often in his salutations in the epistles, writes what? Of himself. Paul, an apostle of God and a servant of God, a servant of our Lord Jesus Christ, doesn't he? That's how he refers to himself. And that's a bond servant. Doulos. There's, there's diakonos and there's doulos. That's the bond servant. That's the one who has willfully, willingly become a servant. That's the guy who, who goes to the door of his master's house and allows the master to pierce his ear with an awl and stick a ring in there. And now he's a willing bond servant of his master. And that's who we are. God's our master. We obey him. We obey him. We do what we're told. Is that the way we live lives? Live our lives? Is that the way we, we conduct our affairs? Just doing what we're told to do? Well, I've, you know, I mean, I've, God's given me a brain. He's given me a back. I can go on and make a way for myself and, and, um, and use the gifts and talents that, that God has given to me. Yeah, God expects you to do that under his lordship. As he directs, as he sees fit. And we sometimes rather presumptuously think of making our own way and, and, and expecting God to put his blessing upon it. I'm not doing anything wrong. Surely this is... Um, this, is, uh, this has got to be a pleasing thing to God. Maybe we should inquire whether or not what we're doing is God's will for our lives. Is he Lord? We're to obey him. John 14, verse 16 says, if you love me, keep my commandments. God's not impressed with lip service, is he? You can have a lovely voice and sing a pleasant song of praise and worship to God. But if you love him, you keep his commandments. If you love him, you do what he tells you to do. You don't just read your Bible and quote it. You don't just attend church. You do what the Bible says, tells you to do. You keep the commandments of God if you really love the Lord. And that is the first and great commandment, isn't it? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And how might we demonstrate our love for the Lord? Well, Jesus tells us right here. If you love me, you keep my commandments. You do the things that I tell you to do. He says in Luke 6, 46, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Do you think that that might that might be characteristic of a lot of professing Christians? You think that that's fair or would that be uncharitable? Would that be unkind? Would that be unchristian to say that there are a lot of professing Christians who, who call Jesus Lord but don't do what he tells them to do? I think that if the Lord had to tell it to folks in the first century, it probably applies to some folks in the 21st century. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I tell you to do? You don't keep my commandments. God's to be obeyed. He's not bought off. He's not bought off. What do I mean there? Uh, people think that they can, they can uh, give to God what maybe other people expect me to give to God. I'll, I'll look spiritual. I'll put some money in the offering plate or I'll, I'll read my Bible some. I'll, I'll attend this church service and I'll, I'll look as good as the next guy. You doing what God told you to do? Are you obeying? You keeping? All those other things are important. You know that. You know how I'm using the example. Does God have our hearts? Are we obeying him? That's what we're, we're told to do that. Look me over to Romans chapter 6. I want us to see, I, I know some of these, I, I give you the reference, but I don't necessarily ask you to turn there. Turn with me to Romans 6. Verse seven, 17, excuse me. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. We're to be a people who obey from the heart, aren't we? Oh, at any given time, the commandment might seem grievous. You know, the Bible says the command is not grievous. Sometimes it feels it. It's, it, 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 it God impresses upon our hearts our need to do what he, he, he tells us to do. And that requires some death to self, doesn't it? But the Bible says that, uh, that uh, when he brings that kind of ministry, that chastening, that instruction, afterward it yields the peaceable fruits of righteousness in us, doesn't it? Yep, it's good for us to submit ourselves under the hand of God and do what he tells us to do. Because 
Uh, where am I going if I'm not doing his will? Boy, that's a, that's, a, that's a sorry course to be on, isn't it? We want to be found in the center of his will, filled with the knowledge of his will and obeying it. Why call me Lord, Lord, when you don't do the things that I tell you to do? We're, we're not just to obey, but we're to obey from the, the heart. We're to obey from the heart. Romans chapter 2, verse 13 says, it's not the hearers of the law that are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. We need to obey. Are you with me there? Hallelujah. Foundational to a healthy walk. <clears throat> and we could go on uh, and, and spend several sessions on just this first point of, of the need for us to exalt the Lord, to hold him in high esteem, to fear him, to obey him. But that the Lord would be exalted in our lives, is, that is foundational, most fundamental to uh, a healthy walk, well-rounded walk uh, as a Christian. I'd like to move to the next point, and that is that in order for us to have a healthy relationship with the Lord, for us to flourish in our walk with the Lord, or for us to prosper and be in good health, even as our soul prospers, the third John chapter, uh, verse 2, <clears throat> verse that we began with, we need to consider that God's word is authoritative. God's word is authoritative. <clears throat> In John 17, verse 17, Jesus prays, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. It's the word of God that is true. That is, it establishes for us what truth is. It helps us to understand what truth is. Uh, the, um, <clears throat> Jesus uh, standing before Pilate is asked, what is truth? What is truth? He, he responds uh, in, uh, not, not in that place, uh, but over in John 14, uh, Jesus declares himself to be the truth, doesn't he? The way, the truth, and the life. Here he prays, sanctify them through, through thy truth. Thy word is truth. It's the word of God that is true. The, the, again, the culture in which we live, I mean, we, we are always, truth is, is changing, isn't it? And we re, we're rewriting history. I saw an interesting one. Uh, I can understand that, uh, I, I, not that I, I'm not saying that I'm in agreement with it, but I can understand that, that, that some folks um, uh, want to uh, remove uh, some of the statues of Confederate heroes. I can maybe begin to understand that, um, that uh, and again, don't look at me like I'm, I'm saying I'm in agreement with the people that want to do that. <laughs> but I can maybe begin to understand that some people would take offense at, um, at uh, championing or you know, holding up as champions and heroes, folks to be admired, uh, people who fought for the Confederacy. But they're taking down statues of folks, of the folks like uh, Jefferson now. You know that, don't you? Yeah. And, and why should we think that's strange, right? Because we live in a culture that's going to rewrite history for us and, and, um, and re, uh, redefine what, what truth is. We live in the, the 1984, uh, Orwell's 1984 era, don't we? Yeah where we have new speak and in whatever they tell you, you know, they, they call uh, two plus two is, is five. If, they, if you tell you it's five, then it's five. Don't you think so? Two plus two is five. Or it can be vanilla if you'd like it to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, um, it's fallen in the streets in a, in a modern, post-Christian, anti-Christian uh, culture. Yeah. But the word of God is true. It's the rock on which we stand. It's the, the light that lights our path. It gives us understanding, doesn't it? Yeah. It's the word of God. We don't have to rely on our own understanding, do we? No, we don't have to. We're taught, no, don't lean to your own understanding. Don't, don't think that you're left by God to try to figure out how to be a good husband or a good father how to manage your affairs or, or just, you know, just yeah, get over all the hurts and pains and uh, 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 disappointments and sorrows that you've experienced. You're not left to yourself to try to figure out how to do any of that. 
God's word makes the way. God's word reveals it. He tells us what we are to hold as valuable and what should be, what should, uh, be held in contempt by us. He teaches, the things, teaches us what to love and what to hate, doesn't he? Yep, he does. And that's all found in his, his word. Is the word of God authoritative in our lives? Well, if you've been around here for any length of time, you know that, nope, if we're gonna, if we're, we're gonna set a course, we're on a course, we're doing something, it's, it's based in the word of God. It is. It's, it's found in, in the scripture. We look to the Bible for, a, for, for instruction, because all scripture is given by inspiration of God, isn't it? And it's pro all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. That's the stuff that we not only profess, but we practice. Profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be, that's what we're talking about, isn't it? Perfect, complete, healthy, whole. It's here in the Bible, isn't it? The words that we have need of, to give us understanding, to give us illumination, to, to light our way. It's found in his word. The word of God is truth. Go with me over to Isaiah chapter 8. Isaiah chapter 8. This would be a good one. I know that a number of you know the verse that I'm going to as soon as I mention Isaiah chapter 8. And, um, and I know that there are some who don't know where I'm going to. Some of you have made, maybe heard this passage or heard me refer to it without giving you the reference before. I trust that it will be a blessing to us all. Here in uh, Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20, the prophet writes, to the law and to the testimony. In the translation that I've got, there's a big exclamation mark after that. To the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. We'll write up above, uh, you know, verse 19, the prophet is uh, reproving the people for consulting wizards and soothsayers and, you know, trying to hear, why are we, why are we the living consulting the dead for, for understanding? He says, to the law and to the testimony. That's where truth is found. You don't have to look any further than that, do you? What to do, where to go, the word of God tells you. I mean, here we are coming up on Christmas season and we, you know, we've got our stories of, uh, of, of buying the, you know, the, the, the kit for the kid and you got to put the pieces together and, and, you know, you look at the picture on the box and this goes there and, and, and uh, it's not working. And last resort, you have to do what? Read the instructions. <laughs> we've, we've come to that. We're that desperate. We've got to read the instructions. <clears throat> Don't have to do that anymore. Just go and watch a YouTube video. <laughs> That's the 21st century read the instructions. God's given to us a book that tells us how to live our lives in every area of our lives. Every area of our lives. I speak of being a, 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 a good parent. God teach you how to be a good parent. How to be there for your kids. How to communicate love, but teach them to respect. Both are important, aren't they? You know, your children ought to, ought to know you and have the, the highest esteem for you. But uh, there are some parents that, that, that try to get so close to their kids, they want to be their kid's best friend. And, uh, and, and, they, and, the, and the children lose respect for their parents. The children need uh, to be disciplined properly, but not overly severely. Kids need to be spanked, but they need to be spanked in love. The rod and reproof bring wisdom. Not just, not just beat them, you know, and, 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 until they uh, are beaten into subjection. No, they need spankings. But they need instruction from the word of God too, don't they? In a loving, caring, compassionate, consistent manner, don't they? What about consistency? And all these things are spoken to in the word of God. All these things are spoken to in the word of God. And 
don't forget where we're, you know, the, the, the direction that we take in this teaching. At any given time, we'll be here talking about biblical principles that pertain to disciplining and training, rearing your children. And maybe you were, you were here for the session on, uh, on praise and worship or, or the session on um, uh, 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 how to evangelize. And you missed the one on training your kids. And it's not just any given session. At any given time during any given teaching, there may be just a, a, f a few sentences that could be very, very helpful. Uh, very, very helpful. Because they were from God for you and for your situation. Were you here? Did you have ears to hear? See, that's just, these are... These are all emphasized in the word, not emphasized, these are all included in the word of God, these truths that pertain to every area of our lives. And we, uh, when we have ears to hear, we come with hearts ready to receive and believe that God is going to minister to the needs that we have, then we position ourselves to partake of his richest and best. Amen? To the law and to the testimony, says verse 20. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Well, you know that we endeavor to do things according to what the Bible has to say. Amen? Amen. Across the board, it applies to everybody. The way we manage our time, the values that we hold, the things that, uh, all the emphasis that there is on, on gathering and having our lives knit together. Uh, why? Because the Bible teaches us that we are a, a body, a body, the church of Jesus Christ. We're not just off all doing our own thing. That's all found in the word of God, isn't it? We didn't just come up with that. We're, you know, where we just try to have some nice, close-knit social group. No. The body of Christ makes increase of itself in love in preparation for Jesus' soon return. And that ministry is to take place until we all come into the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. I'd say we got our work cut out for us. Hmm? Gathering? So much the more as you see the day approaching. Is the world not falling around before our eyes? Falling apart before our eyes all around us? Yeah. Yep. Jesus is coming back soon. And we find in his word instruction on how we are to live to the hour of his return, to the law and to the testimony. His word is pure. His word is pure. God's light and in him there is no darkness at all, is there? Don't you love that passage over there in 1 John? God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. No dark side to God. Some of your um, superhero friends maybe have a little bit of a sinister side to them. They're good most of the time, but they've got a little darkness in them. Not so with God. Not so with his word. Psalm 12, verse 6, the words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Proverbs 30, verses 5 and 6. Every word of God is pure. He's a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words. Don't add to it. And don't take away from it. Don't add to God's word. You got people that want to presume, say, well, you know, I just sense in my Heart of hearts, this is what God's got for me. <clears throat> to the law and to the testimony. What's the Bible have to say? What saith the scripture? What's the Bible have to say? Well, I just really sense, I really, I really, really feel that this is what God's got. What's the Bible have to say on the subject? Are there plain principles in the word of God that would support your position? Or are there plain principles in the word of God that you're violating by taking this particular course to the law and to the testimony. God's words are pure. God's words are pure. To the words of God are pure. Add not unto his words, lest he reprove thee and thou be found a liar. The word of the Lord is perfect. Psalm 19. Didn't the kids do a great job there last Sunday afternoon? From verse 7 of Psalm 19. The law of the Lord is perfect. That's is scripturally, most of the time when the word perfect appears, it refers to a completeness, a completeness. There are some people that think that the Bible 
has principles that would pertain to things spiritual. So, you know, you can have your sins forgiven and you can go to heaven one day. Well, that would be a pretty small and simplistic view of what the intent of the scripture is. God's wisdom touches every area of our lives, every area of our lives. It does teach us how to conduct our affairs. If you're lazy, God's word teaches you, don't be lazy, get out of bed. If you don't like work, God tells you, know, you don't want to go to work, God tells you, go to work. You don't like working on the job, God tells you, do a good job on the job, as unto the Lord, and on and on and on it goes. Amen? It's perfect. It's complete. This word, this word of God. And what are we talking about today? We're talking about how a healthy Christian life is founded on these truths. And we endeavor to, to, uh, <clears throat> to cultivate and maintain an, uh, an environment here at this fellowship where these truths are kept real close and adhered to and built upon. If you're not building your life on the word of God, then you're on shifting sand. And that house is going to come down. But when you're founded on the word of God, you're rock, slot, rock solid. And the storms will come and the winds will blow and you'll not be shaken because you're founded on the rock. He says here, further on in Psalm 19, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Love that, converts the soul. It, it, it transforms, it renews our, our souls. The testimony, testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. The word of God is perfect, perfect, in that it is complete. You will not lack for anything. Don't add to it. And don't take away from it. Doesn't need, God doesn't need our help. He's given to us sufficient wisdom for us to live our lives very, very successfully in his sight. And here, when we're done, well done, good and faithful servant. And that should be something that every one of us desires to hear. Every one of us uh, holds in our heart a desire, a longing to be able to stand before God as judge one day soon and hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. You live your life according to his word, not making excuses for your circumstances, not trying to get God to bend the rules because of your preferences. No, you live your life according to his word and you will hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Guaranteed. God guarantees it. God guarantees it. The word of God is timeless. Timeless. There are those that would consider the Bible antiquated and its, and its uh, wisdom no longer applicable to all the issues that we have before us in modern, enlightened 21st century society. Hogwash. The word of God is timeless. People have not changed. Anybody that thinks the times have changed and the people have changed, well, they're, 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 they're uh, at best uh, uh, simple and ignorant. And I'm being kind. In John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Time's been around forever. And it will always be around. The Word of God is timeless. In Psalm 119, verse 152, Long ago... I learned from your statutes that you established them to last forever. I learned a long time ago as I read your word that your word will last forever. It will, it will endure the test of time and the changes that come to, to humankind. Your word will go on forever. Psalm 119 verse 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. It's, uh, it's, it, it stands firm. Isn't that what we want to build upon? Hmm? Isn't that what we want to base our decisions upon? Aren't, aren't, aren't the, the values that are revealed in the word of God to be used to establish our values? I mean, we, we think of our tomorrows, where we would like to be and what we would like to do and what we... Have we referred to the word of God 
to find out what's important to him? What he places value on? You know, <clears throat> Jim and I were talking the other day and, and, and there are a whole lot of things that, uh, that you have maybe over the years thought of, of, of wanting to do someday. And that as the years go by, you recognize, mm, I'm probably never going to do that. I, you know, if I were to be realistic, I'd probably never get around to, to doing that, going there, doing that. Is that a problem? If you're living your life in the center of God's will, that's not a problem at all. His life is a vapor. It's a vapor. I mean, how, how many ever wanted to climb a big high mountain? Hmm? How many ever traveled? Just now, okay, yeah. Who wants to climb Everest, man? <laughs> What's wrong with those people? I mean, I like the view from a high mountain, you know, but I want to be in my car looking out at the windshield. And I, you know, I have no desire whatsoever to climb Everest. But, you know, people that have these dreams, you know, they, they listen, I, I'll get you. How many have ever wanted to go to a South Sea Island? <laughs> yeah, I'll take a South Sea Island. I wouldn't mind going to Fiji or Bora Bora or something like that. Borneo, that'd be cool. <clears throat> But I probably never will. I probably never will. You, you know, you ever, um, uh, you're on, you got your computer on and all those beautiful screensaver pictures, go, you know, come on up. You think, wow, that's a cool place. I never knew there was such a beautiful place in the world. And, and they just, every day there's a different one up there. And that'd be cool to go there. Most of us will never go to those places. And that's not a problem, is it? No, it's not a problem. No, we're just passing through. Just passing through. See, God's word abides forever. And we're going to live forever with him. And to, to the Bible, we look for the values that we hold. It shouldn't be a big deal if I never get to do this or go there and do that. No, because, because I've gotten to know God through his word and I find out what, what really matters. His, his word establishes for us what's important, what's valuable, what's precious, and what is vile. Amen? His word, it's timeless. We're caught up, we're all too caught up with the here and now all too often, aren't we? Well, I just really always wanted to do that. I really wanted to go here and do this. And, and, and God's word, timeless, teaches us that we were made for eternity. And we don't have to get all caught up and bogged down with the here and now, do we? No. <clears throat> First Peter chapter 1, verse 23 speaks of being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 24 and 25. All flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. Grass withers, and its flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached to you. The word of God abides forever. It's timeless. Timeless wisdom and encouragement that we have, been passed, we have passed from death unto life. We're, we're now living in the eternal. You, you've already, if you're a born-again Christian, you've already passed from death unto life. You started everlasting life. Everlasting life for you has already begun. These are truths taught to us in his word, which is a timeless word. And he promised that God gives to us regarding everlasting life comes to us from a word that does not change. You know, I could, I could uh, tell uh, my brother Steve here, listen, Steve, whatever comes your way, I'll be there for you. But if I drop dead tomorrow, <laughs> and he's got a promise next week. <laughs> yeah, you know. But God's word is timeless, isn't it? It's enduring and it is abiding. It does not change. And Christians who have a healthy walk with the Lord in every area of their lives regard God's word as authoritative. They, they, they consider it the, it's the standard by which they live. It establishes right and wrong for them. It's, our <clears throat> it's the wisdom by which we live. The word of God is the wisdom by which we live. Proverbs 14, verse 12. And, oh, aha. The word of God is timeless. And I see we're about out of time this morning. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
we'll pick it up there. You know, I, just the, the, the word of God is the wisdom by which we live. We'll, we'll pick it up there. We'll, <clears throat> as, I, as I say, the, these are, are points uh, that any of, and any of which could be uh, uh, developed further. Uh, we're, we're wanting to talk about Maybe consider it the, uh, the why we do what we do, why we do as we do around here, here at our, our fellowship. Why do we do the things we do? Why do we not do the things that we don't do? Because we're doing them according to the word of God. And Jesus is Lord. We believe God's on his throne. We believe he's coming back soon. We're endeavoring to live our lives in every area of our lives in a manner that pleases him and prepares us for Jesus' soon return. Amen? Amen. So the exaltation of God, God first and foremost in our lives, that's, that's, that's foundational, most foundational. The word of God being authoritative. It's the standard by which we live our lives. Amen? Amen. Always to the law and to the testimony. Live our lives, let them line up with what God has to say and we'll be, we'll be on a good course, well-lit course. Let's bow our heads before him. Heavenly Father, we do thank you and praise you for the work of your spirit imparting life to us. It is never your desire for us to be imbalanced in our walk with you. At any given time, you may emphasize a particular truth in a particular area of our walk. But you don't want us to be lopsided. You certainly don't want us to be negligent of truths that we need. Truths that will result in our growing and maturing into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We thank you, Father God, that as a loving Heavenly Father, you know what we have need of. You feed us well. You teach us and train us in the truths that you impart. We thank you for it, Father God. Help us to be a people ready to hear, a people teachable, and a people that appreciate the thoroughness of your involvement in our lives. Thank you, Father. Let's stand together and Sing unto the Lord as we finish up this morning. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Father God. We bless and praise your holy name. Be exalted in our lives and in our midst, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'll be sure and greet one another in the love of the Lord Jesus. God's grace and peace go with you all.